There's one key design technique that, once I found it and started to use it in my designs, things really began to change. In generic and rigid layouts, design objects and assets have their own space. However, if you want to bring an advanced element into your design work, consider overlapping objects and using transparency modes. Actually, there are many strong valid reasons for this. Firstly, overlapping objects and using transparency on a design can help guide the viewer's gaze or their journey through a design. If a design element bleeds over another design element, it can instinctively lead the viewer to move to the next section of a design. This also adds an extra sense of intrigue and depth to your design and it makes it look more interesting. Thus, your viewer becomes more engaged. When it comes to this technique, remember just one key sentence. Things that break over the edges on a design are really easily noticed by the viewer, hence why this is used to direct the viewer's eye on a design. Overlapping, when combined with transparency modes, can actually simulate depths within a 2D space or 2D design. And when done correctly, this can make elements appear to be in front or behind others, enhancing the illusion of a multi-layered environment. And me personally, I really dig, I really do love this multimedia style. Look how the blue flowers appear to be in the background, with the main focal point stretching right over it. Or as you can see here, something as simple as having leaves bleed over the two sections of a design, making it suggest that the natural scene above at the top is in the background. It's a very subtle layout choice, but it works really well. And then there's this simple design truth. Transparency effects are simply just good to look at. They can add a touch of elegance and sophistication to your design work, and that's just with a few clicks of your mouse. By blending elements together, you can create more subtle and nuanced visual effects to your artwork. The first method is where colour palettes are generated based on analogies or associations with concepts, ideas or other elements. That might sound confusing but it really isn't, and this method is very useful when you want to evoke specific emotions, a theme, a symbolic meaning through colour. So let's say you are tasked with creating the artwork for a website based around mental health awareness, or even to design the website itself. Colour analogies method requires that we first pick out emotions to target. And for this website here, the desired emotion is empathy and support. You will probably decide that the website should evoke feelings of peace, comfort and hope for visitors seeking mental health resources and information. And once you have that research, we then look at how colours are typically associated with the emotions of peace, comfort and hope. But in this context, warmer soft colours like soothing blues and gentle pastels are often linked to comfort and understanding while shades of green can represent growth, renewal and hope. So begin by selecting a base colour. In this case, you might choose a soft, comforting blue as it signifies empathy and understanding. Then, complement this with pastel shades like light lavender or soft pink to represent comfort and compassion. Now these colours can be used for background elements which creates a gentle and nurturing atmosphere. To inject a sense of hope and growth, add a touch of light green or mint green as an accent colour. Now this colour can be used for call to actions or to highlight important information, symbolising the potential for renewal and positive change. However, here's the complete flip side to all of this. Now, you might actually have determined in the brief that this audience of the website are young teenagers in regard to mental health. And in which case, you might want to increase the saturation away from pastel colours and use things like bright bold orange as a base colour, which will trigger a sense of action and change, which helps with positivity and hope. Share your design with colleagues, clients or target audience members to gather some feedback. Their perspectives can help you refine and enhance the colour palette. Always keep in mind the accessibility of your design, especially if it's intended for digital platforms. Make sure the text remains legible and the colour choices adhere to accessibility standards. This is called Synesthesia Inspired Colour Selection and it's a creative and an unconventional approach to choosing colour combinations in graphic design. For this one, let's design materials for a jazz music festival. 
we first want to get a vibe and a feel for jazz music, so research and understand what is associated with jazz in terms of colour. For example, jazz might be linked to deep blues and cool purples because they're kind of peaceful and relaxed, while the excitement of a jazz solo might evoke a vibrant red or a fiery orange. Now this next step does dive deeply into the senses and so as a designer yourself, you want to close your eyes and listen to the jazz music. Think about what kind of colours spring to mind when you listen to the music itself. Perhaps a cool blue represents the smooth melodies, while the energetic reds mirror the improvisational solos as previously mentioned. But in this jazz example, we want to write down a code or a language in regard to colour. And that might look something like this. Once you have that language, you can begin to consider other aspects such as emotion, audience and context. Start to build a colour palette for your project, and you may want to base this around a base colour by adding complementary colours from your associations. For instance, you can use fiery reds and oranges as accent colours, and they will represent the excitement and spontaneity of jazz solos. Also maybe experiment with different shades and tones of these colours to create harmonious palettes but do ensure the colours create a visual connection to the emotions and unique experience of jazz. We first need an image or a design, and then to copy that with Command or Control C. Then, with it still selected, press Command or Control 2 to lock it down in position. And then finally, Command or Control F to paste a duplicate exactly over the top. We want to add a Gaussian blur to the duplication, and we want to add a medium kind of blur. Nothing too crazy, but also nothing too mild. For the next step, you can use any sort of shape you think will work for your design, but just to quickly show you guys today, I'm going to use two rectangles to create a shape like so, and then I'm going to unite it in the Pathfinder window. I always find it really handy to have the most tools that I use just off to the panel on the right. I'm sure you agree too. But yeah, once united, I will press A for the direct selection tool and then click and drag the live corners to round off my shape. This is a personal preference and it's not necessary to do. Again, it just depends on the kind of design that you're actually working on. Make sure you're happy with where the shape is on your composition and then copy it with Command or Control C. Once it is copied, select the blurred layer and the object together. We're going to make a clipping mask and that's done just like this. So we're going to make use of that copy now by pressing Command or Control F, and that will paste a duplication right over the top once more. And with this one, we're going to add a gradient, but use the freeform gradient tool. Now we want to add multiple white nodes to the shape, especially around the edges. This will make more sense soon, don't worry. And also remove all of the other nodes that are not white just by pressing backspace when they are selected. Now for this effect to work really well, it's wise to double click the nodes and make some of them transparent with a low or a zero opacity. Now I do like to keep fully white nodes closer to the edges for this effect, and that's because it looks more realistic which you will soon see later. Now it might very well take some time fiddling around with this thing, and you can come back later to edit the gradient. But when you think you're ready, change the transparency mode to something like soft light. And as you can see it's starting to take shape. And like I said, all you have to do is press G with this layer selected and the nodes will appear so you can edit the gradient again. You might also want to lower the opacity of this layer if the effect seems a bit, you know, a bit harsh. Now we have two more crucial steps we have to do before this thing looks decent in today's video. And the first one is to again generate that duplication with Command or Control F. Now to this layer, we're going to add a texture effect by heading into the texturizer. We can use sandstone, canvas, or whatever you like really, but it is probably best to keep the relief quite low. For this layer, I'm going to use a transparency mode of lighten, and hey presto, we now have a slight texture on this layer. Actually, let's rock with screen for this one, it's probably a better choice. Now we're going to use one more duplication, and for this one, press Shift and X to flick that fill over to a stroke. Now press C for the scissors tool and click twice on your shape like this, 
and that's going to allow us to then remove an excess which will leave a corner. Okay, now press Shift and W for the Width tool. And we're going to play around with this line so it bulges a bit in the middle and closes at the each end. Now when that's ready, assign the correct stroke weight for your design and then apply a white color to the stroke. It's important to now add a Gaussian blur, but nothing overly blurry or over the top. We can press A for the direct selection tool and move the anchor points around just like this. And in this specific instance here, I think I'm going to lower the opacity so the effect isn't too stark and too contrasting. Now you can repeat this step multiple times to add a blurred corner or some edges to this specific shape on your design. And I do really wish I had more time on my hands to make a proper design using this, but right here, this is just an example I made pretty quickly. Of course, typography does finish and complete a design. But yeah, this effect can be used for marketing and advertising, posters and designs like that, or even to make things like typography. For much of this technique to actually work, we need text and anything along with it grouped together with Command or Control G. Now the tool in question here is the free transform tool which you can find right here. Often people can't find the extra toolbar menu because it's actually hidden behind the tools panel. Anyway, if I go and manipulate my group like so, we can see it only edits the shape. Sure, we could actually outline the text, but that's not actually productive for a non-destructive workflow. But instead, come up to Effect and then navigate to the free distort, which is found here. In the new box, we can make a distortion. And hey, Adobe, if you're listening, it would be really nice to have a preview option while doing this. Just a thought. But the really cool thing about this is that, of course, the text is 100% editable. I can just come back and edit the text or change it in any way, anytime. Another cool thing we could do is to apply a twist or other distortions from the distort and transform menu. That's pretty cool. And again, the typography is editable. But let's quickly make something that actually looks half decent, right? Now I'm going to duplicate this text just by holding down the Alt Option key and clicking and dragging. This is a free font, by the way, from Fontesque. I think it's called Toronto, but yeah, I'll place the ID on screen somewhere. Now, let's add a bit of character to that text in the appearance panel by adding a slight golden glow to it. There's nothing wrong with a bit of bling now and again, of course. Then we can apply the twist effect that we saw earlier. And actually that does look pretty cool if I don't say so myself. Distorting typography is a good technique to know. And also now you know how to do it while keeping the text editable. Now take a glance at this design right here. And maybe whilst you're just looking at it, your mouth might start to water a tiny bit. The person or persons who designed this didn't just sit down and start designing like that. Now before they made a single pixel or vector path, they visualized what the design should be like. Let's jump back to this example again to illustrate the point. Now, some of the goals this design might have had would be to make the viewer have a sense of fresh, real ingredients through the product, and also that it's really sour to the taste. The designers used fresh cuts of real fruit along with ice to give that kind of fresh coolness feeling. The entire design is explosive, bursting out from the center to express that punchy, sour nature of this product. When you know what the end goal is and the message should be for a design, then you can start working your design choices into the artwork itself. It also works really well for logo designing as well. Just like this jujitsu logo I designed quite a while ago now. I wanted something that looked strong, but also which had a sense of community and which was slightly passive. And that's because just the nature of jujitsu. 
so I used curves as well as angle straight lines that helped give that impression and also it actually incorporated a fist into the design as well. Now this was doable because I worked backwards so to speak. Once you know how the end result should be then you can start designing. Contrast can go far deeper than having just two contrasting colors or something really big and something really small. This design here uses an interesting form of contrast. Now we can see how bold and graphic the typography is, matched with the line illustrations at the bottom. It's a very flat and bold design. That is apart from the gradient 3D design towards the middle. And this is a direct contrast of design style. And here's another prime example. You can see how the designers have mixed bold and graphic backgrounds that are filled in with block colors and contrasted that with real imagery often mixed with blending mode options. So as a bonus tip, check out this design right here. Now it actually shows one error that some designers are guilty of when it comes to using contrast. Now if we look at this typography here, we can see they've tried to create hierarchy with contrasting font weights. When doing this, try not to use wide leading or space between each line, and also don't just use one weight bolder or one weight thinner. Put that thing right up to the max so contrast is really apparent. Think how you can add something to your design that is unique, that will really help embed itself into the memory of the viewer. The thing is though, it needs to be relevant to the message and also the brief, but let me explain. This bottled water design does it really, really well. People who buy this will remember the cool concept of that whale on the design. It's a talking point among other people and groups of friends, and it's one way how products spread throughout communities. And then you have this brand here who are selling something as simple as fabric wool. But look at the packaging on this product. It's creative, it's fun, and it's memorable. Humor is a great way to create a memory hook, just like this bag design right here. It's a unique and fun design, again, super memorable, and it's a great way to elevate something like a standard brown bag. Other designs can be memorable because they are weird or shocking. This poster gives a lot of room to that shouting head graphic, which might I add is basically all mouth and nothing else. This graphic is striking and it will likely be memorable to the viewer. Memory hooks are ever so more important these days due to the amount of design work that the average person consumes every single day online, their smartphones and so on. Now we have one fiery chili that does look pretty menacing. Let's ask ourselves, what is the one thing missing from this design as it is right now? For me personally, it's that the white background just isn't working out here. And so logically, we would actually want to go ahead and add a vibrant background to match the hot kind of chili. But still, it isn't packing that punch that I really do want. And the background doesn't do this justice and it seems just really flat. So this is what we're going to do. First, click your background and convert it to a smart filter. This is going to allow us to do the next steps in today's video, which is going to be adding a vignette. It's easily done in this window here found in Photoshop. Make sure to head to the custom tab and then play around with these sliders found right here. If it doesn't look suitable, don't really worry too much about that right now. But if we generate this as a starting base, we can see things already do look a bit better. Increasing the brightness does help quite a lot with this kind of design. Let's add some noise to the background for some decent and interesting textures. Be careful though because the smallest amount has a big effect with this tool. Okay, so lastly for the big finale is the big shabuzel. We're going to add an oval of white and then slap a Gaussian blur onto it. Make sure that we do actually have enough blur so it's going to blend into the background really, really seamlessly. And speaking of which, we want to change the blend mode to something like soft light. And after some jiggery pokery, we can now see the design is way more interesting and it's more impacting as well. This sort of technique is heavily used in marketing and advertising 
is typically used when posters or things like that have a focal point and the product needs to be emphasized. Taking a look at this design right here, what can we identify as a main problem on this artwork in terms of the color? Now the palette might seem a bit confused with no harmony, and there might be issues using shades of green on this blue background. Actually quite a big issue. However, if we use the 60, 30, 10 rule and we put more focus on the base or the dominant color, less emphasis on our neutral colors, and finally we use a very small amount of accent colors to catch people's attention. In the first design, there were just way too many accent colors, and this can lead a viewer to become distracted or confused. We can even maybe drop the coffee mug down to this kind of very dark blue, and now your eyes really should glide over this design really freely as a viewer. Let's quickly step over to Adobe Color and extract the colors from each of these two designs. And it's obvious which palette is more appealing and more user-friendly. Hint Hint is the second one. So yeah, try and focus on 60% or there around 60% for the base color, 30% for neutral colors, and the remaining 10% for your accent colors. But remember, there will always be exceptions to most rules, and this is just a kind of guide to color use. So, on this design, we can start by implementing the first step, and that is to make sure your typography is one to two colors, sometimes three in rare instances. Unless you're going for a kind of brutalist design, this Instagram advert is already looking a bit neater. Now the next step is when, in doubt, align to the left and rag to the right. Basically, align the start of your typography to the left edge and have the rag over on the right. I've also finished step three on this design, which is not to use too many different type point sizes. Of course, you should be contrasting in size, but just don't go crazy with it and use too many different sizes on one design. Also consider proximity when you group sizes together. Lastly, use one to two typefaces on a design. This design actually only uses one typeface, and yes, we do have different fonts from a typeface, Basement Grotesque, but because they are the same style visually from one typeface, the design is tied together in a neater kind of fashion. Take a look at this file size. This simply isn't acceptable guys, I need to lighten the load on this one. So, what we can do is open up the PST document and literally just hide all of your layers and then save the PST once again. If I now go and check the file size on both of these files, we can see that the new one is actually smaller in size than the original file. How cool is that, just by hiding layers? But wait, there's actually a bonus tip. Now create a simple layer on top of the layer stack that explains that everything on this document is hidden to reduce the file size. This layer will not take up so much room on your file as well. This means that whoever receives this file needs to just simply click the eye icon in the layers panel. There is a trick that totally blew my mind when I learned about it. Let's say for example, I'm working on the highlights and shadows of this model with a dodge and burn tool. I would have to keep zooming in and out of my project, much like an artist stepping back from their canvas to inspect their work. Come up to Window, Arrange, and then choose the name of your document. This will open up your document into two different windows. What you do on one of the windows will actually happen simultaneously on the other. Then come up to Window and Arrange once more, but this time we can lay out our documents in a way where we can see both at once, either vertically or horizontally. Now I can zoom into one window, for me often that's the right one for some reason, and then I can keep the left window as a far out kind of view. That means I can carry on working zoomed in and see the overall design in real time on the left. It's pretty cool.
And firstly, we need to look at where the light is coming from on our object. And to me, it seems like it's from the left side of the design where the light source would probably be. So my shadow is probably going to point and move towards the right of my design in some kind of way. Get this wrong and your design will simply look unrealistic and just an impossible fact of nature. So let's press L for the ellipse tool and then create a shape like so. Now we're going to add a gradient, but the next few steps are very, very important. For one side of your gradient, make sure it's a dark kind of black. And I've gone for a more charcoal kind of black here as opposed to jet black. But for the opposite side of the gradient, we want to sample the background color by pressing I on your keyboard and then just sampling the color. Then heading into the color here, we can copy the hex code with command or control C. Now head back to the gradient and paste in the hex code into the RGB slider with command or control V. We want this side of the gradient to either be 0% opacity or for it just to be a low kind of percent. And that's so it blends into your design smoothly. Make sure your object is to the front of the layers and then add a Gaussian blur to your ellipse. Now you might be thinking to yourself, that's it, shadow complete. But hey, you'd be wrong. Often when working with raster effects like this in Illustrator, we have unfavorable edges like you can see at the very top edge right here. The best workaround for this is to add a feather effect which can be found up here at the top. While you're doing this, click preview and have a look at what kind of values work best for your shadow and then when you're ready, just hit OK. The great thing about this is that we can edit the shape and even the gradient after having added the blur effect. You might even want to add a second darker blur kind of closer to the hand for extra depth. Forget about modular grids and totally ignore column grids and throw that golden ratio right into the trash. Irregular grids have a multitude of uses and use cases for graphic designers. Firstly, take a look at this design here. One key element of irregular grid layouts is that they can contribute to a sense of disorder or a sense of chaos. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if your design needs to express an anti-establishment message or something unconventional, then irregular grid layouts are a way to do just that. But we can also use irregular grids in a more subtle way. Irregular grids also express a break of the norm. There's something cutting edge and a little bit innovative. An irregular layout here on this design elevates it beyond the norm or the basic, and it suggests that the product or the subject that it's showcasing is innovative and modern. Most generic layouts tell you to stay away from the edges of your design, and certainly never to bleed over the edge fully. Well, take a look at this design right here. When a design purposely smashes through the borders, it can suggest a sense of liberation freedom, but also it evokes a sense of motion and energy, which as you can see on this design here is perfect for a sporting brief. So if you need to create disorder, anti-establishment, energy or innovation, consider an irregular grid layout for your next project. Now here I'm using Miller Notes, but you can use any platform, program, or just simply a piece of paper. So when you have a project brief, try and narrow that brief down to a single simple sentence or message. So for a poster that needs to bring the dangers of drink driving to the awareness of people, I've got here the reality of drink driving is deadly serious. This is the first step in this hack. By doing this, we actually set the tone and the direction of our design in relation to the project brief. If we pick out some keywords and some goals from the brief and then condense it down into a message like this, we're on the way to making a supremely useful and effective graphic design solution. Next, we want to focus on emotion and so jot down some emotional responses that are going to allow your design to properly get the main message across to the viewer. 
So here we can see that I've chosen emotions that will help drive the point home to the viewer that drink driving is serious, it's deadly, and it's no joke. I want my design to have a shock factor so the message is clear and it stays in the minds of the viewer. The next phase is where things get stepped up a gear in this process. This is where we think about design techniques that can express the emotional response that we want to get on our design. And here I've just written down three to demonstrate. Now I want to have a focal point that is shocking and draws the viewer into my design. I really want to emphasize on a lot of white space to make the message clear and concise and to perhaps also give a clinical or bleak outlook on my design. This will drive home the message that drink driving is in fact really serious and it can be bleak for the people involved. And then I go into color schemes that will perhaps help my design cause the emotional responses in the viewers that I want to deliver with the message. And lastly, we can add imagery to help build up an overall density of the design to generate ideas. But me personally, as a designer, I don't really find this stage to be that helpful. But we all think and we all design in different ways, of course. But now the big reveal. As you can see, I have really focused on white space to make the visual communication both striking and clear. The focal point is shocking and suggestive to the message of drink driving, and I've worked in the concept of crossing the line of drinking to then actually driving. Now this is a great hack to put into your design process, but it shouldn't be your entire design process most of the time. Expanding on concepts and generating ideas via this method is really, really useful. The next hack is in Photoshop, and it's me having fun with a new technique. It's a way to blur things on your design work via a menu I've only just found out about this year. Now I've got my text and then a different layer below that. Then come over to adjustments and then add a gradient map. Click on the gradient and then go ahead and add more color nodes along with the colors in those nodes that are gonna fill up your blur effect. Once that's prepped and ready to rock and roll, select your text layer and then come up to filter the blur gallery and then tilt shift. Now this can be tricky and the outcome depends on your gradient map. You must convert the text to a smart object as well. So increase the blur value and then have a play around with the settings on the design itself. Now you can rotate it and increase the blur as you go. And like I said, it might take a while for you to get the hang of it or until you're satisfied. And if you're not quite satisfied with the outlook, you might wanna come back and change your gradient map. But yeah, this is a lot of fun and using the blur gallery has been something new to me and something I've been playing around with. We all know how important typography actually is and what you're about to see will help you use typography in more efficient ways. The first typographic step is that before you design anything, ask yourself who is the viewer and then choose two different contrasting fonts. So here's a design with just one font, Elrond Regular. The design looks okay, but we can decide to run with a bold and modern font such as Archivo Black, and then contrast that with something a bit more serious like Alio. Now I chose Archivo because it's modern and dynamic, which does fit the audience for a sports product. And then also Alio establishes a professional and legible touch to the body text. We can also go with something like Elron Black and Elron Regular, as you can see right here. Apply font psychology and just choose two contrasting fonts. And this is a surprisingly easy way to make your designs look really well put together and just very professional. Now, if we disregard the obvious scale and perspective impossibilities in this image that do break the laws of physics, which one of these two designs looks more realistic? Hopefully you said this one here. Now let's look at how we can actually add some hyper-realistic light into Photoshop, but the quick method. There are many ways to give a lighting effect in Photoshop and this might not be the most ideal, but it's really effective and it's really fast. Firstly, of course, you need to make sure that the image you choose or the image you take has a light side and then a darker side. So press Command or Control T and then also Control click to access this menu here and I'm gonna flip it horizontally. 
Now press Command or Control J to duplicate this layer, just in case I ever want to come back to a base copy or the original image. And then we're going to add a gradient map adjustment layer found right here. This is one of the most important steps in the process. Now we want to click the gradient slider here and then use the two similar colors from the background. So for the shadows, I'm gonna go for a very dark blue, almost black, and then white for the highlights. Right now, it obviously doesn't look ideal. So what we can do is to play around with the layer blend modes and adjust the opacity. Overlay is looking pretty neat actually, but we still need to complete the process. And for that, you need to change the foreground color to a CMYK value of 00050, which should be a kind of gray. Then create a new layer, and this will be our dodge and burn layer. And make sure that it's actually in the front of all layers. Now hold down the Alt or the Option key and then press Delete. And this should cover your layer with a kind of gray foreground color. But if you end up with a gray color just masking the focal point like you can see here, hold down the Alt Option key and then click between these two layers. Now if you change the layer blend mode to something like soft lights, we do have a nice soft effect across the design. But importantly, we can now use the dodge and burn tools on the design to enhance shadows and highlights. The dodge tool, which is this kind of lollipop or magnifying glass icon, will be for the highlights. And the hand icon, which is the burn tool, would enhance the shadows. So you yeah, just take your time and do this in low exposure settings, something probably below 10. This technique is great for adding the extra touches and depths to your designs, and you might have noticed in some of my thumbnails, I do use this technique. Now, if your design has an element of energy, we need to focus on a few things to make it look proper and effective. Looking at this design here, we have obvious energy or movement with the cyclist on a bike. But what appears to be wrong in this design? What do you see that's ineffective? So the cyclist kind of looks like he's frozen in time, just totally flat. There's gonna be no prize money or medals for this guy until we make some crucial changes. So firstly, let's create some kind of vector shadow so our guy doesn't look like he's floating in midair. And then secondly, some cliche speed lines. Things still look a bit naff if you ask me, so I'm gonna add some context to the floor in the same directional movement or energy as he's headed. And also use italics on the title to give the viewer more sense of movement. Looking at the original design and then this final solution, we can see how vastly improved it is simply considering energy and movement. Movement on a design actually makes things more memorable to a viewer and just more interesting. And it's a really great way to get your message across when used in the right context. Logo designing and layouts. And if you've designed logos, I'm sure you've gotten to this stage where you just don't know how to lay things out in terms of the logo type, but you know you want it to look professional and proper. But here are some tips just for that. We want to create some contrast in the logo type in terms of size. But importantly, you might have noticed that the smaller line of logo type aligns with the logo symbol. This is one way to add harmony and also contrast on a design. However, on the logo symbol below the tail, there is a lot of white space that even though the design is aligned, it kind of seems a bit off balance. So we can nudge the symbol over to the left a little bit to balance the whole design. Often a logo isn't balanced because it's aligned perfectly, but because it's actually visually balanced, which is very important. And then on this design here, if you want the symbol to be smaller, we can create lines coming from the symbol down to the secondary logo type like so. Another useful tool for playing with logo designs and other things that use titles and such is the scale tool. Now, if I want the secondary logo type to be 50% of the main logo type, you can just select the scale tool, hit enter, and then make it exactly 50%. I can then do the same for the logo mark, but maybe this time I want to go for 75% of the main logo type. This brings in a mathematical precision, and it's a good way to include harmony and balance to logo designs. And again, the white space below the tail is kind of making things seem a bit off, so let's give it a nudge to the left again.
Let's say that I've seen this banana image somewhere online and maybe I do love the style and I want to see more relevant artwork just like this. It might even be that I just want to see more designs based around bananas. Come into Google Images and then just drag and drop your image inside like this. Google will now bring up a ton of other relevant images or designs that fit this style, color and overall look of your example. I find this a hugely powerful tool for research in aspects of graphic design and simply just getting inspired. But less said about this one here, the better, I think. But yeah, just drag and drop your designs into Google Images for a deep inspiration into specific kinds of design. One of the first tips that can help you make better, more attractive gradients is to opt for radial gradients over linear gradients. Now Adobe Illustrator is my go-to choice for most graphics, but due to it being a vector-based program, gradients can be tricky to get right. Having the center of your gradient towards one corner really does help to add depth and a new level of smoothness to the outputs. Often the radial gradients will also have less banding compared to linear gradients, which is obviously optimal for prints. Now taking that a step further, the freeform gradient tool in Illustrator is a super smooth option. Using this tool, you can have a far deeper level of control over the mood and also the layout of your gradient. You can pick and choose where the nodes go and you can really make some stunning results with this tool. But the best is yet to come and as we move through the tips in today's video, you will see why. Now let's ask this question, what if we still have banding on our gradients? There are various different things that we can actually do, but the first one is something you can try in Illustrator that likely will help this problem. And yes, I know how much of a headache it can be when having banding on gradients. But yeah, head up to Effect, Texture, and then we're going to add some grain. We want to add a very small amount of grain to the gradient, so something between 1 and 4 is normally a wise choice and then play with the contrast to something that best suits your project and your gradients. The grain should help to smoothen out the banding issues when printing, so give it a test print and see how it compares to the original printouts. Before we look at more ways to deal with banding, there is one really cool thing we can do with grain on gradients. So take a shape and then copy it with Command or Control C. Paste a duplicate exactly over the top with Command or Control F. For this new shape, we want a linear gradient with one side totally black and the opposite side totally white. However, the white side should have a 0% opacity. We are going to need to adjust the slider so that we have the dark side only covering the shadow aspects of our gradients. And by that I mean the gradient base layer. Then, add a grain to this layer and experiment with it until you're happy with the end result. We're going to change the transparency blend mode to multiply and then lower the overall opacity of the layer. Now we can do the same to the lighter sides of the gradient, but in complete reverse so the black side has 0% opacity and the white is set to 100%. Also the blend mode of this one should be something like overlay, but you can experiment with blend modes and see what works best for your specific design. These shadow and highlight texture gradients are really good for illustrations and digital arts, and they're just fun to play with. And just a quick bonus tip, did you know that you can take text and overlay it on gradients in Illustrator, and even if you have multiple layers like we've just worked with, you can still select everything and then apply a clip and mask you will still be able to edit your text, and I just think that's a pretty cool tip. But anyway, addressing that banding once more. The more colors you use, the better the gradient will typically look when printed. So take this example here that's made up of just two gradient nodes or two colors. Instead of comprising our gradient of just two colors, instead we can take two end colors and then use two more middle colors. We then press W for the blend tool and blend the three colors together. It now has more depth, more character, and it's likely going to print out as a better quality than the original one. As a general rule, the more colors you apply to a gradient, the less banding you probably will have. Now it should be noted that Photoshop often supplies better and smoother gradients more easily. 
but sometimes we have to use Illustrator for specific projects, and so it's handy to know how to make smooth gradients for vector-based graphics. Photoshop relies on pixels instead of vectors and actually comes up trumps in this instance. But if we are working in Illustrator, work in a document raster effects of 72 ppi, but then when it comes to printing, change this to 300 ppi for the output. This will help ensure that your document raster effects settings are printed out high quality, and I hope that will help you print out and design more fluid, smoother, and more cool gradients. So this is the wrong way to do something that a lot of people actually do in the workflows. They make a selection of something and then they use the Alt Option key to duplicate it all over their design. Doing things this way takes a long time and the end result looks pretty poor. But this is what we do instead. Grab the marquee tool and then make a selection over your object like this. Then hit up the edit and define path to open this window. Give a relevant name to your object pattern and then hit OK. Now simply press Command or Control D to cancel your selection. And we come back into Edit, and this time we're going to use Fill. Now we want to use the Pattern option in Contents. And in the Custom Pattern, choose the one that you've just saved. I like to use the Random Fill for this script here. And make sure to keep the Blending Mode set to Normal. And then you're ready to go. So in the new window, the first four sliders will dictate the style and orientation of your arrangement. And for the desired effect I'm going for, keep the bottom two sliders set to zero. And there you have it, a random pattern of my object in a matter of seconds. Pretty cool. This is a relatively new feature, and it was actually possible in older versions, but it was a giant headache and just a annoying workaround. So now when you're designing something, you can actually come up to Object, Repeat, and Mirror. Whatever you're working on will be mirrored over to the other side of this line. And I personally find this so awesome for creating symmetrical logos, or shapes that are symmetrical such as arrows and so forth. Now it simply just saves a bunch of time and we can be 100% certain our design is symmetrical. And when you're done, just click the grey bar at the top to release the mirror UI and bingo. Just like that, symmetrical icons ready to use. So have a flattened design or image and then press Command or Control J to duplicate your layer. Now we want to isolate part of our design, and you can do this in many different ways, but I'm selecting the subject and then using the quick selection tool to neaten up my selection. But when you're ready, create a clipper mask in the layers window like so. We need some typography, and for my design here, white is probably gonna work best. Make sure you're happy with your text because we're now going to convert it to a smart object by right clicking here. Move it into the middle of your layers, make a duplication, and move that one to the top. Crucially, on the top layer, bring the fill down to 0%, but leave the opacity at 100. Now, we're going to apply a stroke to the top layer via the effects panel. And of course, you can apply whatever stroke you like. I'm personally going for a thin one here on my design. So with the top layer selected, hold down the Alt Option key until you see the icon appear between these layers, and then just click. Hold down the Command or Control key and select both layers and then link them here. Now you should have this cool text effect that whenever you move it, the mask knocks it out, which is really cool. I saw this one on TikTok a while ago, but I can't remember the original poster. When we want to export designs such as logos to screens, it's a quick and easy method to save a bunch of designs at once, right? But did you know there was actually a resolution setting here which allows us to save our designs at super high quality? It's one of those settings that is pretty hidden away actually. So this resolution setting is something not many people know about.
your typography choices can make or break your graphic designs. Sometimes the choices are very subtle and can make big differences. And here's our first example, and like everything in today's video, I've taken this from a resource website. The first tip that can help you make better typography choices is to ask yourself, what is the most important thing on your design? Is it the image at the top here? Is it the text on the left? Or is it the text on the right? As the design is at the moment, it's pretty disorganized and there isn't a clear hierarchy. The image is important, but it's not the most important thing on my design. And so I'm gonna start by adding a section to illustrate the importance on the left edge with regard to the typography. This is a good start, but obviously there isn't a clear hierarchy structure within the typography itself. And again, this goes back to the importance logic that we want to take for our designs. The heading is the important part here. This company offers quality services, so let's make that a bit larger. Now then, you might be saying to yourself, let's go even further with hierarchy and increase the thickness of the heading and possibly the subheadings below as well. And we can do that, of course. You will see how much more impacting the design can be right here. The next choice I want to make is to make sure proximity is used to group together certain elements that are related to one another. So the three points at the bottom should be neatly grouped. And then to add further reinforcement to the heading, I've got a line underneath and a graphic that supports the notion of quality services, the trophy. Literal graphics like this trophy do work on designs like this. But like I said before, I do stay away from this in the logo designing because that's a different game altogether. Here, on a design like this, they quickly help to express and support a textual statement. But what about the text at the bottom right? Well here, I just neatened up the typography a little bit, made it smaller so it's less dominant, which again goes back to the important logic, and then added another literal graphic to support the notion of conversation. This is just a quick example, but the main tip from this first section in today's video is to identify importance on a design and then use hierarchy and other principles to work the typography into important structures. This next design is a web page, and this is going to truly show you how very small and subtle changes can be applied to a design. Now we're looking at the left edge with the modern architecture heading and then the body text below. Now let's say that we actually want to keep the thickness and the font for this heading, and that's because we just think it works well on this design. But we can then maybe just drop the body text from the same black color down to a lighter gray. Yes, this is very, very subtle, but it already creates a sense of contrast and thus highlights hierarchy and importance. Something else quite subtle that people do forget is leading. Now, nine times out of 10, the default leading for body text will be too tight. And that makes the text come across as cramped and just not good for reading experiences. So I'm just gonna increase that leading a little bit. And now the body text has more space between each line. Again, very subtle, but effective. Then I'm looking at the right edge of the body text and how each word creates white space. This is also known as the rag. Often playing around with the word orders and line lengths is a great way to do something on body text that makes it more visually appealing. And that's because as designers, we want to strive for a neat rag edge on body text. Making a small adjustment like so does help with little touches which do make a big difference. Also, line length is important. So say, for example, I decided to make mine here longer. You can see that it doesn't feel right compared to how it was before, breaking into the white space that this design has. And often, white space is the best partner with typography. They kind of work together to build harmony on a design. Now, here's a really cool tip for those of you who are logo designers. It's all well and good grabbing a font for your logo and using it if you have the license, of course. But to really make a unique logo, especially if it's strictly typographic, we need to aim to customize the typography. One neat way to do this is to open up the glyphs panel in, say, Illustrator. Now I'm using the typeface Crimson Pro here, which I do adore. And I'm just browsing over the glyphs to see what might or might not work for the logo. Of course, it's paramount your choices need to reflect the brief and aim at the target audience. But this D here with the strike through it really does appeal to me right here, right now. And on further research, it seems this D is Old English, but also it's seen in Slovak and other languages too. So when using glyphs in this way, do make sure they're relevant to your design and the brief, of course. Now you can also change the thickness and the structures of your typography by using a width tool and other elements, but make sure to keep the same style consistently throughout the typography. 
But yeah, just look how neat this looks now with just one small touch. I do like how the strike is in the middle of the logo itself, which does create balance. But also importantly, it creates a sense of originality and uniqueness. This design is so much more brandable than the original typography solution. And I could actually imagine this on maybe a rum bottle brand or something like that. So as you can see, typography doesn't need to be complicated. You can make subtle changes to help express a message of a design that aren't too elaborate. If you neglect one small but very important aspect of being a graphic designer, you won't get very far in this industry. This video is going to reveal two simple steps you can take to ensure that you master this one aspect and also show you some easy to apply tips along the way. I applied the very same tips myself and these days I actually have to turn away emails from clients because I simply am just too busy. But what is the crucially important aspect of being a graphic designer that I'm talking about? It's actually a simple three letter word and that is yes. You need to firstly ensure that a potential client looks at you as a person and as a designer and says, yes, yes, I want to work with you. And then secondly, later down the line says, yes, I will give you my money for that design. Now that probably sounds very simple, but so many designers are going about this in the wrong way. And don't worry, I'm going to make this super simple for you to follow. And if you do apply what I'm about to tell you in today's video, you'll start to notice upticks in DMs and emails from potential clients. Now the first of two steps is where I'm going to dish out five different tips on something that no graphic designer should ever underestimate, forget, or miss. It's based around portfolios and it actually ensures that a person will become a client or an employer to you as a graphic designer. And this is because the portfolio is your secret key to someone being interested in you as a person and a designer. These days, including this one thing in your portfolio can not only help potential clients or employers stay on your website longer, but it shows them how you operate as a designer. That thing is a process video and it's actually really easy to do. Just make a quick 30 to 60 second video or even just a slideshow of the process you went through on a project and also add that somewhere in the portfolio post itself. This will work wonders to set you above most other portfolios out there. Now tip number two is something that will actually breed a lot of confidence in anybody looking at you as a business, a designer, or even a person. If possible, include post project results and data that demonstrate the impact of your design on the client's goals and their brand or their business. This in of itself is a superpower move. And if you can do this, you really should do it. Something else that builds confidence is feedback and testimonial sections. This breeds credibility in you as a designer and as a person. But don't worry if you don't have any kind of actual projects under your belt. You can also include feedback from colleagues or professors. All of that matched with good solid work. And also the next tip I'm going to explain will conjure up pure magic. In your project posts within the portfolio, pair the problem you're trying to solve to the client with the final solution. It helps viewers understand the context and impact of your work. And if you do this visually as well as in textual form, side by side maybe, you're off to a winning solution. And the fifth tip in the first of two steps in today's video, you have to make sure to optimize your portfolio for search engine results. Use relevant keywords and meta descriptions and I do suggest creating a weekly or a monthly blog somewhere on your portfolio. This over time will build a solid feedback loop and is great for search engine optimization. But also of course, remember that your portfolio should have a consistent style. It should be easy to navigate and you should only exhibit your very best work in the portfolio. But from here, we want to get that second yes from your client or the employer. And that comes from them actually seeing your designs or your concepts and saying yes. When it comes to showing your clients or employer designs or concepts, there are two things you need to remind them of. And in this part of the video, I'm going to be using logo design projects as examples, but of course it works for any kind of design. Now remind your clients what typically makes a good design. So in this case, the principles of a solid functional logo, a logo is timeless, it's memorable and so on. By reminding the client or employer of what makes a good technical design, and then demonstrating how your design aligns with that and also how it plays into the brief will set up a good basis for the rest of your presentation. 
but the second reminder is even more crucial. And that is you want to remind the client or the customer, what are the goals or what are the problems that the brief illustrated? And also you want to explain how your design and your process is going to approach those problems. This is a good time to bring up the goals of the project and the design. You need to explain how your design achieves all of that. An example is a brand that needs to carve out its own space in a saturated market via a logo design. And as a designer, you should know all of the goals at this point in the project. The next tip really helps a client or employer to come around to the idea of your design actually working. Use mockups to show their design is relatable, relevant, and also in unique situations. It could be a pen, a bag, or anything the client or the business uses. Not only does this help them visualize the real use case of your design, but it does add that extra kind of layer to your presentation. It does come across as more professional. But the next thing is so powerful that clients really just love to see it. And that is how the design or the product interacts with the target audience. For example, if the target audience are young urban individuals for a clothing brand, show them interacting with that brand and the product. But importantly, work into the presentation that your design will appeal to the target audience and also why. Not only does this help the client see how targeted your design is, but it can bring them away from their own bias if they have one. The presentation of your design is an art form in of itself. And often being able to sell your design ideas is more important than the design itself or at most equally so. But if you follow today's tips, then you will likely or more than likely get two yeses in every sector that we just spoke about. The design process and the design itself is only half of the game. And yet so many designers do forget this. But yeah, of course, design skills are important as well. And if you wanna learn some crucial tips to making superior designs, just click that video on screen. And until next time guys, design your future today. Peace.